When we talk about big data, the size may be the first and perhaps also the only dimension that pops into your mind. So in this video we're going to explore big data in a bit more depth and we're going to look at uh, the other dimensions, very important dimensions, of what big data is and what we as marketers can do with it. Many of our daily activities will leave a digital footprint. In fact, pretty much all our daily activities that are spent on our devices that are connected to the internet will leave a dig digital footprint. And over the years, uh, that leads to a lot of data. So let's look at some of the sources that we have to big data. I mean, first we have the internal sources, uh, which could be sensor data that a, a business or a company owns, uh, or it could be external sources, such as uh, social media data. Uh, but I think the most important distinction to make be between the different types of, of big data is what we call structured data and unstructured data. Uh, so structured data is organized and searchable. It is data that has been put together in a spreadsheet or in a format so that we can uh, look at it and extract meaning from it. Uh, the other part of big data is what we refer to as unstructured data. and That could be snippets of audio, it could be images, it could be videos, it could also be various types of unstructured text. Uh, text that's been written on social media, for example. So it's data that hasn't been uh, stored and categorized in a meaningful way. And uh, well, some say 80% uh, of all data, all big data is unstructured, while um, according to the reading that I want you to have a look at for today, uh, which is a really great summary paper about big data, uh, argues that about 95% uh, of the big data that we have is unstructured. So how much big data is actually out there? According to Eric Schmidt, the former uh, Google CEO, he said that up until about 2003, we as humans had created about five exabytes of data. Uh, these days we are creating that much data every two days. Uh, and you can have a look at the slide here to, uh, to get a bit of an overview perhaps of how much data this actually is and how much data we are producing these days. Now this chart breaks it down for you a little bit more and it just shows you what is actually happening, how much data is being produced in one particular internet minute. 1.4 uh, million swipes on Tinder for example or 2.1 million snaps are created. Uh, so this gives you a, a little bit of an idea of uh, how much data is being created and stored every single minute of the internet. And the last couple of slides I've shown you should have given you the idea that there is more dimensions to big data than, than just its shared size. Uh, and a good way to understand big data is the V framework. A bit like the four Ps, started with a couple and then it's grown. Now we have about six of them. Uh, and the first one that comes to mind, as I said in the first slide, is quite often the volume. Uh, the quote I had from Eric Smith in Google about how much data we produce every two days compared to what we produced up until 2003 uh, gives you an indicator of the volume that we are dealing with. Uh, but velocity of the data is another is another dimension that's really important. The previous slide showed you a little bit about what's being produced every minute on the internet. So this data is coming at us thick and fast. Uh, some of it becomes redundant quickly and we then need to figure out how to deal with it and uh, whether or not we can structure it quickly and use it into meaningful insights. Uh, variety is another one uh, that is really important. Uh, and that has to do with the uh, heterogeneity heterogeneity of the data. Uh, so it's coming at, at us in many different forms. We have text, we have videos, we have audio, uh, social media data and so forth and we need to quickly be able to sort it out. Now in the paper that I wanted you to have a look at today uh, it lays out the uh, additional three V's and the first one being veracity and that has to do with the uncertainty of the data that we or the, or the big data that we can look at so reviews on social media for example uh, at, or something as, as short as a tweet uh, if you use text mining um, software to, to extract meaning from it it can quite often be misinterpreted so it's not always straightforward and we there's insights there uh, but it's not always reliable Variability is uh, well, slightly different from uh, variety because it also deals with the complexity. You know, big data doesn't always come in a steady stream. It comes in peaks and troughs. 
uh, it's quite often based on uh, on current events that's happening in the marketplace. All of a sudden, we may get a, a massive dump uh, from one particular source based on uh, other external events that's happened. And finally, big data is uh, often referred to as low value density, uh, large, huge dumps, and we need to be able to sort that out, uh, make the unstructured become structure, and then extract the value from it. Now, the key to big data is to structure the unstructured. Uh, in and of itself, or in a vacuum, big data is pretty much useless. And I think figure three in the paper that I wanted you to have a look at today uh, gives a good overview of the big data processes. So first we need to uh, have various tools to manage the data. So this has to do with structuring it, cleaning it. Uh, and from there we can, uh, we can look at modeling and analysis and interpreting and making actual sense of it. And in terms of how, there's mainly two approaches, and that's either machine learning or it's a rule-based approach. approach. Uh, in machine learning, well, that's what my wife does, uh, you employ various algorithms uh, to uh, read, scan through the data, uh, and then extract meaning from that or let the machine learn what's going on, and then uh, generate themes from that. The other, the other way is a rules-based approach. That's more like what I do. Uh, what you can do is to run the data through various types of uh, linguistic programs, running through different types of word lists where you are uh, looking for, you know, how many times is different words mentioned, for example. And you can do that by using emotion words, for example, where you want to see whether or not customers are saying positive or negative things about you. Uh, so that's the rule-based approach. And the other one is, uh, I suppose, is a potential third option, and that is the manual categorization. It's the old school way where you are reading through data and, uh, and highlighting um, the words that you find. A little bit more depth about the marketing challenges of how we can structure the unstructured, so how can we convert big data into value? Uh, well, the first type is, is by text analysis, as I briefly mentioned in the, in the previous slide. Uh, there's various packages that you can use for that. Uh, I think my little illustration here also gives, uh, gives an overview of that. It depends on what you're looking for. Uh, you can count various types of words, that's uh, a very common approach to do it, uh, or otherwise try to extract various types of themes from the data. Uh, of course then the next option is audio uh, analytics, uh, and the way that that's often done uh, when you have uh, audio data is that you first try to convert it into text. Uh, there's uh, a lot of free softwares out there today, Otter is one of them. Uh, Otter is great, you can put in any audio file and it will uh, convert, it, uh, convert it into uh, text. Now moving to video, of course it's a richer media and it's becoming more complex and more difficult. Uh, you can't just transcribe video data, uh, you will then only, you can't only get the audio. Uh, but some areas where video analytics is uh, becoming more and more used is in terms of video surveillance. Uh, so smart cameras that can detect changes and can detect movements, for example, uh, and will then only record those important pieces of, of information is something that is uh, increasing in, uh, in usage these days. A social media analytics is arguably even more complex. Uh, it could deal with simple things such as detecting what's being said about a particular business or brand, for example, uh, but it could also be about looking at some of the structural things that is happening in there. Are you trying to detect communities, for example, sub-communities that have uh, arrived or have sprung up on particular platforms and things like that. Uh, another thing that is uh, uh, quite important and quite often done is to try to find influences, try to find people that have uh, loads of followers on social media, for example, and then reach out uh, to them. Uh, so there's heaps of ways that you can do that, uh, and it, it's becoming then increasingly uh, complex again. And finally, predictive analytics. It's about looking at uh, historical and current data in, in order to try to predict what is going to happen next. Uh, so this is a matter of applying very complex statistical methods uh, in order to try to predict uh, future behavior based on current and past uh, behavior that you observe through a variety of different types of big data. 
So this slide I put in for a bit of uh, fun and games for you. Uh, so these are a few different types of publicly accessible big data. If you're not familiar with Google Trends, you should go and have a look. Uh, it will tell you what's trending on Google basically and you can type in any keyword and it will tell you uh, how often people have searched for it and you can drill down to various types and regions uh, around the world as well. Uh, Google Public Data is another great uh, resource where Google is uh, uh, collected and, uh, and summarized a lot of big data sets from a whole variety of sources. Gapminder is a fantastic source that you should have a look at. Uh, comes out of, of Sweden with the late Hans Rosling, is very uh, uh, award acclaimed uh, professor and statistician. Uh, of course, we have the Australian Bureau of uh, Statistics, and if you want other, have a look at uh, Bernard Marr's blog there. I think he lists about 20 different types of uh, publicly accessible big data sources that you should know about. Uh, some of the ways the big data is used is what we refer to as the segmentation of one or the micro marketing, uh, and this is. Uh, this is quite often autom automated uh, through social media sites or various types of online retailers. Uh, so this is about tailor the marketing mix right down to the specific individual based on their behavior online. Uh, and when we are targeted with ads that is actually you know, related to, to what we are searching for when we are in an I want to buy moment, uh, then that is potentially not perceived as uh, intrusive. Of course we have these sort of unusual associations or what the paper that I wanted you to read talks uh, refers to as uh, spurious correlations. Some of you may remember uh, we talked about the um, correlation between uh, liking curly fries on Facebook and intelligence, typical example. Another one is that credit card companies found that people that buy anti-scruff furniture pads are more likely to make their payments on time. So it doesn't mean that if you go on eBay and you buy uh, anti scruff furniture pads then you need to get a lot of ads for, for credit cards. Uh, so these, these uh, uh, spurious correlations is actually something that we need to uh, analyze and look at when we, uh, in particular, we, ne uh, we need a human to uh, interpret those because a machine so far uh, are, have a hard time to sort out what is a spurious correlation and what is actually a, a reasonable, meaningful relationship. So when we shop online, uh, we are often exposed to recommendation engines uh, that suggest other products to us based on prior interest and uh, also compared with millions of others that have bought similar products. A few ethical issues to consider here as well. Uh, as, as great as it sounds for both consumers and marketers that you'll always just be targeted with exactly the product that you want to buy, uh, there are uh, a potential boundary of where we, we breach privacy and harm. So uh, if we always get you know uh, ads based on our, our prior purchases, then we end up uh, sending ads for donuts to an obese person, for example, or every time I walk past a pub, I'll get a, a message on my phone saying that's oh, that's your favorite beer is on special or whatever it is. I'll never make it home to my wife and kid, and I spend all my afternoons in the pub, which is not good in the long run. Uh, and of course, then it's the filter bubble effect, which is uh, something that you you should know about. Uh, maybe you have a look at the the uh, reference on the slide here as well. Uh, so the filter bubble is because is like when we look at big data, uh, it is all about modeling what is normal and what is in the middle, uh, shaving off all those outliers. Uh, but it is the outliers that makes the human experience so interesting. Uh, so when we are on social media, for example, if we take all our movie recommendations based on the other movies that our friends have seen uh, and talk about on Facebook uh, and our friends are pretty much all like us then when will we ever go and see a movie uh, that is sort of out of our comfort zone so to speak uh, and will actually broaden our horizon that won't happen and that is exactly what the filter bubble is about uh, and this is um, also been attributed to increasing polarization in society, uh, increasingly uh, focus on them and us in groups and out groups and so forth, uh, and it is a potential growing problem. Another thing that can't be repeated too often is that if it's free, then you are not the customer, you are the product. 
Even the pigs understand this, as they discuss on the slide here. And if you had an offer with all, you can always go to the go Google opt-out village. And I'll leave you with that. Have a click on this link, and there's this uh, funny little video from The Onion uh, about uh, how it may be if you were to opt out of Google altogether.